on to the next one of the Global Development Lecture Series, the Development at Manchester Series. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Abdul-Malik Simone, who I probably haven't known that well for, except for a few years, but I feel I've known you really very well since a book I read, must be all of 15 years ago, called The City Yet to Come. And I think for me this was really a very evocative introduction to something that urbanists were very conscious of, and which was that cities, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, certainly in Asia, were an emerging phenomena that were changing very rapidly. Um, so over the next few years, I engage much more with your work. And I think, as you would describe yourself as an activist scholar, but really from a presentation I saw at the African Centre for Cities, I would say Abdul Malik is a poet activist scholar. He has the ability to create the realities of the global south on the written page, which is really quite astonishing. So I know it's the end of a very busy week from the Max Planck Institute. You spent a little bit of time in Cambridge, then to Brussels and now here. So we're very grateful for you for finding time to come. Um, you are somewhere I had the presentation. So you're going to talk about a title entitled Flickering in the Dark, Urban Tissue as Provisional Care. I'm sure this will draw a lot on your experiences with Jakarta, as well as other cities in which you've worked. I am aware that you've drawn on a wide experience of different cities, the time you spent in South Africa and India, as well as Indonesia. Those of you who are particularly interested, I just draw attention to a book that Abdul Malik has recently written with Edgar Petersay from the African Centre for Cities called New Urban Worlds Inhabiting Dissident Times. I think it's very illuminating about the themes which Abdul Malik has been talking about for some time. What is going on in cities of the global south? What are the changes that we have to understand if we're to engage with those realities? So I don't want to really to take up any more of your time, because I'm conscious you are here to listen to Abdul Malik. We, you, you talk for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. Thank you, uh, thank you Diana. Uh, thanks for coming out, everyone. Um, I spent the last day, 10 days being presenting and being grilled over a, 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 a new book that will be coming out next year, that's sort of heavy theory, so I'm going to take a vacation and uh, basically read a bunch of stories, um, if I may. So um, to inhabit uh, usually entails knowing something about the place in which dwelling occurs. Certainly urban residents today generally have plenty of knowledge about the ins and outs of the places they got to deal with. Every single location is overdetermined and sometimes overwhelmed by a surfeit of information. While floods of knowledge don't necessarily mean that people are better informed or capable of knowing what to do with the conditions they face, nevertheless, it can't be said that anyone is operating in the dark. But still, a kind of darkness prevails, despite an array of feedback and ratings and interoperable data generated almost about ev almost every point on the map. Urban residents in many cities increasingly don't know where they are. It's not a matter of geographical illiteracy or social confusion. Rather, the complexities of urban environments can make things excessively opaque. There's just too much going on and too much to know and too many factors at work in order for residents to come up with a coherent working narrative about what it is that either makes them feel the way they do or accounts for the situations they got to deal with. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on residents operating in the dark. And it's not that some secret is stashed away, unavailable to their scrutiny. It's not that there are conspiracies behind the scenes that manipulate the decisions of residents how they decide where to live, or how they spend their hard-earned cash, or how to organize daily life. 
Rather, it's the sheer panoply of heterogeneous actions, all the ins and outs and feedback loops that run up and down discernible scales that seems to throw everyone off the tracks. How things get done entails a much more multiple and provisional set of tactical maneuvers, financing, and governance. While the inequities of power deepen and resources are even more skewed to the dispositions of the elite, urban areas seem to generate an increased volume of noise, even as developers and politicians and bankers and mafias all seem to consolidate larger volumes of assets and affordances in territory. Turning up the volume here induces large numbers of cascading failures and tricks that backfire and deceptions that reveal inordinate stupidity. <clears throat> so I want to explore in this talk some of the ways in which residents of Jakarta particularly deal with this dark. A situation where many countervailing realities seem to all be equally possible and appearing. Where the accelerated, haphazard, and brazenly opportunistic expansions of the built environment that seek to get a far away from what the city was before seem to continue to and cultivate forms of care of people looking out for each other. I want to return to the old architectural notion of urban tissue, what Andy Merrifield calls, and I quote, the urban as a fine-grained texturing, as a mosaic and fractal form that has some delicate content, some feel to it, something we can touch and manipulate in our own conceptual hands, thinking freely as it were, end of quote. So this tissue is the materiality of encounter among things and materials and bodies, each articulated to each other in ways that exceed the capacity to map or measure and account for their oscillating relationships. It's tissue as the push and pull of different practices of connection that simultaneously compete with and complement each other, not in consensus, but in cross-patterning of stitch and weave and turn-taking and looking out for that Toni Morrison attributes to the quilting gatherings of women in her novel home. Survival means covering the angles, hedging all the different ways in which things can be disrupted and changed. So tissue is not the seamless connectivity of everything. It's rather that which enjoins different forms of speculation, risk-taking, of hedging, and shape-shifting. It is the quilting of seemingly contradictory ways of doing things. It's the texture of ambiguity, of not knowing for sure, of a willingness to go this way or that, of not knowing for sure the position from which one speaks. Tissue compresses distinctions of... Tissue compresses distinctions and identities in ways that make them inoperable. Compression turns tissue into a mode of appearance that need not constantly announce itself and its network positions. Compression is a mode of appearance that circumvents the imperative that everything got to relate to each other. And as such, compression is not the simultaneously folding in of the powerful or the weak. It's not one thing or another, but rather it's a kind of withdrawal from distinction. Compression becomes a kind of darkness. And it's in, it's, in a, it's in an atmosphere of compression where, at least in Jakarta, more and more people are living. Now, I've, I've long been concerned with districts of the working poor across Africa and Asia. These districts are sites of a lot of energy, full of cascading surges and attenuations, speed up, slow down the grinding repetitiveness of labor across small factories and workshops, all conceal other rhythms made up of rash experiments and investments, sudden decisions to take up different trades temporarily, retreats into different shrines, and surges of sometimes amphetamine-extended work hours, surprise visits, convivial exchanges get that can't find any ready conclusion. The day in and the day out, that might be the resounding reality, but it also provides a cover for 
many other itineraries. The prevailing political game, while seeking to extract as much as it can or to provoke time-consuming internecine disputes, doesn't know quite what to do with the power that these districts generate. Residents consumed by labor-intensive struggles to make ends meet, locked into particular social formations and territorial consolidations and repeated compensations for deficient services, they don't know quite what themselves to do with their own power. But all this self-generated energy that shows up in labor and leisure and devotion it always threatens to burn itself out without new inputs, without new things coming in. And so exha exhaustion sets in and energy is no longer renewable. These districts exist as intricate machines of experimentation, but it's an experimentation that often don't go nowhere. And what happens when this nowhere becomes increasingly costly and deadly? rather than acting as an incentive to completely move with the changes of the larger city? What happens when this, this experimentation fails to invigorate the willingness for residents to try things against the apparent grain or prevailing wisdom? Yet these, the, these districts... Yet these districts... Yeah. Yet an urban, an urban tissue holds in place the plurality of activities and sentiments necessary for people to operate in close proximity to each other, as both sources of information and support, and also that from which one is to be distinguished, inciting individualized attempts to carve out some kind of niche. As such, it's an urban tissue that couples accountability and anonymity, traceable lines and unknowable intersections, reachability and imperviousness, articulation and detachment, visibility and invisibility. There's just too much going on for anyone to exert any kind of overarching claim on controlling it, even though certain figures from headmen to Molana to party bosses to goons, all of them loom large in people's imaginations and in delivering a territory to various connections and and electoral and symbolic projects. Political participation often takes place behind the scenes in everyday transactions that residents, contractors, and workers have with each other. Hierarchies are everywhere. A certain few walk away with the bulk of the proceeds and the district's overall productivity. But the back alleys are also replete with ebbs and flows of success and failure sudden spurts of money and uneven droughts. From mosque to mosque, bureaucracy to bureaucracy, and factory to factory, there's both official and unofficial emissaries suturing predictable and unexpected outcomes. Everything shifts to the side one way or another. It is possible for residents to not get stuck. At the same time, working-class districts are increasingly locked into a limited scope of maneuverability to the reiteration of long-honed practices that sustain particular levels of livelihood and complexions of sociality. These are unable to provide platforms for great leaps, for trajectories of progressive or radical transformation that enable residents to shape the larger urban context in ways that provide for enhanced justice and opportunity. Clearly, residents of these working-class districts often seek a different kind of life, characterized by both greater consumption and less arduous working hours. Perhaps more important is their desire for exposure and access to a wider set of experiences, experiences that don't judge them for any relative ineptness, that allow them to put their stamp on things. Yet, the complex entanglements among household composition, entrepreneurial networks, financial reciprocities and dependencies, the dense fabric of everyday living arrangements, the profusion of tipping points, the multiplicity of risks and impulsive maneuvers, the intensive scrutiny of individual behavior, coupled with the indifference largely shown to individualized needs, 
All of these things, the entanglement of all these things, provides a thick fabric that's difficult to alter and reweave. Residents are constantly doing something, but are increasingly unsure about what that something is, what it means, and what value it has. Yet the repetition of all this provides some semblance of stability. It's not necessarily a precarious life. The situation that residents possess is usually felt to be all right, is okay. But it also constantly renders the limit of what it can be and what it can turn into. The attainment of stability just this side of precarity then becomes both security and trap. And because it's both security and trap, a, certainly, a certain ambivalence prevails in the ways that some urban residents think about their life, think about their situations, and think about their prospects. Without the distance of perspective, it's not clear just how they should anticipate, how, how they should anticipate or plan what they think is possible or viable. What is familiar and relied upon often insists upon showing up in strange ways. How then do residents endure such a situation? And then, so then, the, in, the, in, the, in this, the next part, I want to talk about then some examples of what I call the rhythms of endurance, where endurance is, is not a program, it's not a policy, it's not a, it's not a thing, it's, it's a rhythm, a rhythm of oscillations, of start and stop, of different kinds of ways of paying attention to things, of dealing with, de with each other. So I'm going to talk, talk about two, two booties, the story of two booties, the booty call. Booty and I sit on the Booty and I sit on a large makeshift sofa he has constructed along a small creek that runs alongside the shack he constructed nearly 30 years ago. Just on the other side are the concrete fortifications that prop up Basura City, a recently comple completed mega-complex intended for 30,000 residents with nine massive power blocks. The Prongpong neighborhood where Booty lives is a warren of tiny lanes and courtyards, packed with mostly two- to three-story self-built houses of very legal standing and durability. It's the site of a well-known market, and given its proximity to the urban core and to several major thoroughfares, is also packed with short-term residents, short-term renters, as residents have subdivided their places into hundreds of boarding houses. The density is such that, with the exception of the improvised courtyards that have been designed as small communal spaces and playgrounds, the sun rarely penetrates. This lends an atmosphere of foreboding to what is otherwise highly convivial public demeanors, which in turn mask the undercurrents of all kinds of illicit economies, long practiced with both a sense of community pride and dissimulation. This is an area where goods fall off the trucks, where police lieutenants gamble deep into the night, where crystal meth is packaged as a brand of popular candy and shipped to the middle-class suburbs. It's an area where small-time local wholesalers know how to speak to farmers in the near periphery and thus sell some of the freshest and cheapest produce in the city. This is an area where the original long-term inhabitants carve up their holdings in such a way as to make it nearly impossible to tell for sure to whom precisely any given piece of land belongs, thus warding off many prior attempts on the part of the big players to try and seize control of anything that takes place within it. The city's most infinite secret detention center is located in the district with its cells ranging in quality from those similar to luxury hotels to snake pits, with its many renowned inmates needing to pursue the businesses that landed them there in the first place, all of which provide sources of local employment. Booty and I sit and enjoy the cool breeze that runs along the fetid waters and the garbage-strewn embankment below, and try to talk about all these things in the classic roundabout pretend not to know anything, but of course we all know that you do, Jakarta style. His level of involvement in neighborhood affairs need not be addressed directly, as he makes 
made this clear through the way in which he summarizes the key events in his life. He hasn't had a regular job in 17 years, not since the Indo-Chinese warehouse he used to work at closed in nearby Pondok Bamboo, a closure prompted not only by the death of the owner, but in the mysterious disappearance of half of the stock. Booty Shack, a squat one-story one box of found wood and a tin roof sitting illegally on the creek's shore had barely been altered on the outside since he built it decades ago, although the interior demanded a great deal of repair due to the frequent floods, but also reflected the capacity to consume the latest appliances and electronics powered through pirate connections. His wife had passed two years ago, and together they had raised 11 children there, seven of them now living elsewhere, and all of the kids he had put through some kind of university education. It turns out that this perpetually makeshift residence on land he never pays anything for, and on which he rents out some small space for neighbors to park their motorbikes, is not his only option. Booty owns a fairly big house in Bogor, at the southeast end of Jakarta's metro region, but prefers to rent it out to, the, to an extended family because it's simply too far away and sits in a neighborhood that is much too quiet. Quiet in Prompung is a sign of alarm, a sign that something has gone wrong, that there's been some kind of interruption in the flow of traffic, in the circulation of information, the connections between one game and another, between all of the efforts of local residents to make ends meet, to make the ends of whatever they're involved in with meet somewhere, not in a process of mutual implication, but simply as the quilting of one big safety net that doesn't leave anything and anyone hanging. Even though they are long the minority of residents here, the still predominant culture of the Batali, as the, in, in, as the original inhabitants are known, don't like to be seen running and chasing after every crumb. It's important to not come off looking desperate like rats scurrying about, but instead to sit back, enjoy the breeze, smoke a cigarette and eat a mango, look like you're barely doing nothing. While we are sitting, Booty is frequently approached and beckoned for some seemingly small task or another, most of which he dismisses. After a bit, when I ask him if I'm, if I'm keeping him from doing something, he indicates that those who have all sought something from him during the past half hour or so inevitably would have run into each other anyway, and that simply by doing so would bring a fresh perspective to whatever they felt needed to be done at the time. This would be as much that Booty would explicitly say about neighborhood business. But he would add some oblique comment that it was important for people that lived here not to tip the scales too far in any one direction. I asked him how having 30,000 new, mostly young, aspiring, middle-class neighbors might tip the scales for him and his neighborhood. After all, particularly for the residents in the towers overlooking this neighborhood, the visage of a, of a serious slum could not be that reassuring. Would this development, coupled with the strategic location Pumpung assumed in the larger scheme of things, accelerate eviction and regeneration? But Booty was not concerned. He enjoyed the open concerts and the festivals held every s Sunday in Basura's shopping mall. He cited a substantial increase in turnovers at the market as many Basura residents sought to escape the high prices and low quality of the Carrefour supermarket in the complex. Then he explained how the housing market of Basura relied upon people's assessment that it was more important to live close to the central city and be provided with all kinds of amenities minutes from where they lived instead of having to waste time with long commutes and traveling here and there in order to buy stuff. That it was important to save time in order to make the connections one needed in order to, to advance one's cause, as he put it. Otherwise, why would people be interested in paying good money to live in a tiny apartment? Creating a tightly bound world within a larger one, Booty says, is worth it, only to the extent that, only to the extent to which a person can really get to know what that larger world was like and all the different experiences that it had to offer. He knew that cramming in a family of 11 kids into a makeshift shack didn't make it easy for anyone. 
Time and scheduling things, even for sleep, had to be fine-grained, intricately managed. Booty said that his wife would often complain about why they didn't just simply go and live in that bigger house in Bogor. But Booty said, but Booty said this was just exasperation and never a serious proposal. They endured these conditions not as a challenge to their sense of self-worth, or because these conditions were antithetical to what they felt they deserved in life, but rather because these conditions just happened to be the byproduct of their wanting to live with the city and all that it offered as, in as full a way as possible. Budi's reluctance to talk about neighborhood business, while a reiteration of Indonesian manners, was also due, I think, to his sense that it would be nearly impossible to have anything really meaningful to say about what this business was anyway. He mentioned several times that residents simply didn't stand by passively and watch what was happening to them. It wasn't that they were not interested in finding ways to collectively, collectively improve the local conditions. It wasn't that they weren't interested in making their tenancy and environment more secure. It wasn't that they were that they 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 were it wasn't that they were invested in hiding some cachet of secrets. Rather, the whole reason for living in Pum Pum, the whole reason for the kind of economic activities and games they were involved with, and all the brokerage and wheeling and dealing and risk taking, was in order to piece together an expansive space of maneuver in, access to an engagement with the densities of intersections that seem to adhere in urban life. These densities were not imagined as a specific destination or a trajectory of development. For in Prung Poon, in many respects, the densities came to it, ran through it as part of some larger circulatory system. Yeah, okay, sometimes the police had to be paid too much. Sometimes the floodwaters ravaged hard-earned consumption. Sometimes it cost too much to do things off the books than on the books. Life was hard and hard won. But there was little sentiment on the part of residents to put too much of whatever they earned into a single objective. Prung Pung was a place on standby, not as a concession to some larger determinant power from which they were awaiting final adjudication for their fate, but rather as a willingness to follow how making ends meet might play out as particular actors and places and practices and resources and specializations were brought together in a disposition that might be hard to calculate in advance, a willing to give this process its due, but to not make an inordinate commitment to it, to bail out if quickly it was required. This approach to endurance is what Booty indicated was the difference between his side of the creek and the other. He says, we have found a way for things to come, come to us. After all, here you are, sitting on this sofa next to me. Over there, they got their security guards, their access cards, <coughs> all kinds of rules about who comes and goes. Yet, the entire project was built on land of uncertain legal status. They have all of this security and money, but perhaps in the long run, they're no more secure than we are here. But what we have here, it's hard to put your finger on exactly. So many things are pressed so tightly against each other that it's hard to tell what is what. But when you walk around, even though you know these people all your life, every day makes them somewhat different than what they were before. Somehow they may seem to be waiting for something different to happen. And the thing is, is that it does. Maybe not in ways that you can always say clearly, but they seem to know that they are touching a nerve somewhere, that something gets rerouted through this place in a way that was not intended. Just like God himself never intended to get involved in much of the business he ended up having to deal with anyway. End of quote. I sit with Booty, another Booty in one of the makeshift bars and brothels that line the elevated train track just behind the Islamic University of Al-Qaeda, Hashemite, and Matraman. Budi has run this bar for nearly 25 years and for which he provides services primarily for truckers who ply the nearby Jadinagara market and its associated gem, bird, and flower markets, 
as well as the major pharmaceutical market at Pramuka. It is late afternoon, and it will be hours before anyone bothers to set up shop, start cooking, or lining up the beers. The strip is hidden in plain sight, barely detectable from ground level, but everyone in the surrounding neighborhoods knows that it's there. While subject to periodic cleanup campaign, these amount to merely ritualistic shakedowns where once the sex workers were consigned to filthy rooms in the back of bars, they now more frequently live in the areas underneath the rails in small but well-functioning houses that they have largely built themselves. Much of the urban fabric in this area has been reworked to accommodate big roads and large commercial buildings, but these ancient markets persist given the popularity and affordability of their products. The area has long been a breeding ground for tough operators a reputation that goes back to the days when the Dutch attempted to pacify it as a center of enduring militancy by building their own residential compounds here. Like the markets themselves with their down and in the dirt quality, with an infrastructure sagging and heaving from all the weight of commerce and indifference to repair, the bars along the railway haven't changed much either in their physical character or modes of operation even as booty points in every direction to the signs of encroachment. New mega housing developments, shopping malls, flyovers, and commercial buildings. He designates this area of Matraman Jatinagara as the heart of the city, with its history of Arab settlements and institutions, its gang wars and army encampments, its early rollout of middle-class living next to working-class districts who hadn't bothered to refurbish set buildings over a century old. This was never a peaceful area, particularly as the notorious Berlan gangs formed by the kids of army officials fought the kids of Shiite factory workers protect, protecting their neighborhoods, who in turn fought the kids of Flory's Catholic low-level police officers in Mangarai. It was never really clear what these fights were about, but Booty pointed out that they kept the blood flowing, not necessarily on the street, but in the sensibilities of residents who could never stomach Suharto's new order, even though they often acted as the willing henchmen for it, but at the same time made the regime anxious with their capacities to hatch new conspiracies, new rackets, and populist obsessions. All kinds of discrepant aspirations and beliefs and ways of doing things managed to stand uneasily next to each other, replete with tensions and intolerance, but they stood next to each other, allowed each other to exist. Booty would hear all of the stories, and for the most part, the prostitution business he helped manage was more often an excuse for people from different places to loosen their tongues under the auspices of loosening their pants. It was a place no one should have been at anyway, so there was nothing to lose in issuing reports from the front. Booty played all sides. And he emphasizes that such a maneuver is more necessary now than it ever has been. Otherwise, I quote, we are going to get pushed out and this heart is going to get fat. End of quote. He bemoans the current obsession with fighting for the integrity of the faith, the tons of golf money floating around, and for seeing in every problem in Jakarta a conspiracy against Islam waged by communist cockroaches that were not put to rest in the massacres of 1965. While Booty points to intensifying divisions in the military that have long attempted to resolve themselves through old-fashioned red-baiting, he also says that there's a deeper anxiety among Jakartans about what it is that they're supposed to do with themselves in a city whose capacity to make things is drowning in just-in-time just delivery of nearly everything a process that Booty says wears away Jakartan's long honed capacities for everyday negotiation, of figuring out the value of potential relations among livelihoods and places and, uh, and, uh, and entrepreneurship. What Booty calls the 17th parallel in an ironic play with communist phobias and militarization, the strip that runs from Jatinagara to Pramuka is not yet colonized by developers' aspirations which provide the big payoffs to the political parties. The 17th parallel maintains its mix of sin and mysticism, thuggery and cooperation, commerce, commerce 
and popular folklore. The strip of bars along the rails is situated so that the management can see what's coming from all sides, a skill that was put to use for much more than running the sex business. For from here one can see the 17th parallel up and down, all the way from the trade in fake drugs to fake gems with a lot of real stuff in between. Deep into the night, the bars with their cheap lanterns and dung doot music still cater to a variety of tastes. But Booty cares less about being a barman than some kind of guerrilla operative as he huddles over maps with a coterie of young men, pointing out just who should be informed that some stall owners in the bird market are being harassed by vigilantes organized by a distant mosque, of who in the local authority should be bribed and how much to stop a planning application going through for a new petrol station around the corner, about which journalists should receive the cell phone made movie of a local political hack assaulting the daughter of a friend who refused to sell his share in an informal parking lot that the hack wanted to sell for an upscale apartment block. Booty's not going to stand by and let all the grandsons and granddaughters of the street toughs and teachers, the dealers and healers, that made this strip be pushed from the heart of the city. Demilitarized or not, for Booty, the 17th parallel is about the proximity of having many sides. Here there is no reunification, no putting everything in the same box. It's not that the heart of the city is fixed in one spot. It's not that it can be transplanted, transplanted somewhere else in order to survive. Booty says, people can make what they can out of anywhere they might find themselves. He says, rather, this place here, again pointing to the line that runs from Jati Nagar to Pramuka, can't endure without it. Between now and 2021, 750,000 units of so-called affordable housing are scheduled to appear across Jakarta. This would seem to indicate the consolidation of vertical living as the predominant form of residential life. But what does this mean? First, the development of such mega complexes, and this is, I have a, a, a this is where I live half the time. Uh, first, the development of such mega complexes largely in a process, operates largely in a process of hit and run. It often is built on land that has been acquired through temporary use rights. Units are usually sold prior to construction and often on a speculative basis, whereby units are resold before the project is completed to avoid property taxes, and where the subsequent buyers are often brokers who then parcel out these properties through various subcontracting arrangements. There are often many ambiguities in terms of what constitutes a unit of property or the definition of an acquired asset. Residents are also informed after the fact that property titles can't be issued until all of the intended units of a project, such as those still waiting to be built, are sold, given the often opaque legal arrangements between the developer and the owner of the land. Sometimes the acquisition of an apartment does not include guaranteed access to the provisions of water and electricity. So what ensues is that some in these complexes, given the plurality of leasing arrangements and titling and service contracts, residents are paying a different price each month for what are otherwise equivalent units. As the bulk of the units on offer measure 36 to 40 square, 2 square meters, the physical space does not correspond to the size of most households that end up acquiring them. In other words, the prevailing imaginary <coughs> presumes occupants to be an aspirant young middle-class couple with one or two small children who will eventually proceed to move on somewhere else. But as these types of unit are rapidly becoming the new norm, it's difficult to foresee exactly what that somewhere else might be. I mean, it's just, it's just not really a somewhere else. Um, as mortgage systems are limited in, in Jakarta, acquisition entails a broad mobilization of finance. So what kind of money is brought to bear in terms of acquiring this stuff? Well, there's complex reciprocal borrowing arrangements among families and extended kin. There's profits from collectively generated economic activities and savings groups. There's the diversion of laundering 
illicitly obtained money. There's advances on rental agreements from other properties. There's property swaps or amenity packages for employees. The sheer plurality of finance applied to the acquisition of units also translates in a heterogeneity of residential compositions. Sometimes residents related through various neighborhood institutional or work connections will inquire, in, acquire entire floors in these buildings. While most buildings are prefabricated, limiting the physical adjustments that can be made, floor, floors are indeed remade within these constraints to accommodate extent, extended families. So in some instances, you have, you have extended families that live on, have acquired an entire floor of these buildings and basically live a kind of neighborhood life within, within this sort of vertical situation. What often ensues is the agglomeration of social differences that not only mirror the compositions of the old popular working class neighborhoods, but at times attain a heterogeneity that exceed them. Given that the new environments are not contingent upon residents working out a wide range of both everyday residential and economic activities with each other, an atm atmosphere of anonymity prevails, re reinforced by the sheer number of residents involved. Yet at the same time, this atmosphere of anonymity doesn't necessarily lessen opportunities for residents to pay attention to each other, to take note of each other, and to work out allocations of niche spaces and the recalibration of floors and buildings to accommodate specific clusters of interest and identities. So you have, you know, you have different kinds of niche markets within these buildings. You have queer floors, you have super Muslim floors, you have young professional floors, you have all kinds of floors that in some ways live next to each other, but yet maintain themselves in somewhat separate worlds, but nonetheless continue to pay attention to each other, watch each other, but don't necessarily feel that they have to necessarily deal with each other. So th this, this, this example of Kalibata City, it's a standard outlay of 18 towers, high-rise towers, 3,000 units, a population of nearly 30,000 people. On the surface, there's almost nothing to distinguish the housing complex from the hundreds of other so-called affordable housing developments across Southeast Asia. Unlike many other similar developments, however, there's been some attempt to landscape the ground level with scores of small shops and restaurants and coffee houses and public spaces, all of which provide opportunities for residents and outsiders to attain a sense of just how heterogeneous the makeup of this complex actually is. Part of this heterogeneity can be attributed to Kalibata's central location and proximity to a major commuter train line, which given Jakarta's massive traffic problems is a key factor in the population's decisions about where to locate themselves. Even though the complex is, really, is only five years old, with most of the units having been sold before completion, it's subject to scores of varying subcontracting arrangements and layering of use rights, multiple forms of ownership, and internal local governance systems. That is, Kalibata compresses a wide range of financial mobilizations that, again, draw upon individual and collective savings, speculation, lateral borrowing networks, remuneration for work, favors, money laundering, the pooled assets of many different kinds of associations, and barter, where, for example, that sometimes land is land at other locations is exchanged for apartments, and sometimes apartments are exchanged for jobs, and jobs exchanged for apartments. And there's all kinds of different, all kinds of different financial deals at, at, at work here. So, in some ways, Kalibata City is a place that enables actors to write themselves into whatever is happening a place where different actors can recognize something of themselves wherever they look at it. Its residential base is perhaps exemplary of a sense of the many that one can find in Jakarta, where people of different incomes, religious and sexual identif identifications and age, age groups largely live without conflict and close proximity to each other, something that you sometimes increasingly can't find in other parts of the, of, of the city. Even as particular kinds of identities may be consolidated with, within specific buildings, and that those identities progressively colonize specific blocks, 
the ways in which the character of public spaces across the complex change during the course of the day points to the proliferation of niches and differential intersections of all kinds. So you might, might have one coffee house that between 8 and 9 in the morning is you know, a group of, of women who don't work playing cards. Then later on, it becomes a meeting point for activists. Then it becomes a meeting point for African migrants who watch soccer games. Then it becomes, I mean, it just changes the, the one place, changes uh, its composition many times during the course of one day. Yet all of this takes place without continuous forms of monitoring or intervention. In part, this is because the composition is no longer a collection of really discernibly differentiated identities, but rather provisional formulations, where residents are more or less many different things at different times, depending upon who they are dealing with, both inside and outside the complex. So this is not a kind of consensus or a kind of working out of identity politics. It's a place which renders residents different things at different times to each other. So it's, you always have to say, well, what, you know, who are you for me and who, are, are you, you know, who am I for you? A kind of working out something that is not fixed in terms of what these personalities are. So while such shaky characters, where, where all the residents are become shaky characters, can produce an intense sense of volatility, as evidenced in the large numbers of inexplicable deaths, and more diffuse strange occurrences, they really rarely leave any kind of aftershock, as residents are always readjusting themselves in relationship to each other. So take the situation of individual units in a large apartment block. They all have nominal owners, even in a situation where none of them possesses outright certification guaranteeing access to the unit in perpetuity. Given the ambiguities of ownership and the rapid deterioration of the infrastructure, the normative objective of most people who own these assets is to squeeze as much money from the units as possible. As most owners don't really live in a particular complex in which their unit is purchased, the use of the unit, like who uses it, how that use is managed, is brokered by various agents who handle a varying number of apartments and these agents eventually acquire a diverse portfolio of units to rent out, according to all kinds of temporalities. So a broker wants to acquire a kind of a variety of a portfolio. Units that he rents or she rents out by the day, by the month, weekly, by the year. So I mean, the brokers attempt to have a kind of wide-ranging portfolio of things that are made use of according to different temporalities and according to different kinds of contracts. These portfolios are managed in ways homologous to derivatives, where implicit understandings are drawn that enable various brokers to acquire various units from each other at some time in the future, according to specific conditions that prevail at the time. These, and so, so there's exchange amongst, so my portfolio, I'm always exchanging pieces of my portfolio with you. We have an understanding that if certain conditions happen in the future, you will give me some of yours and I will give you some of mine. Now the conditions of these implicit contracts may, may vary. The conditions may, the conditions may be the rate of the deterioration of a particular unit. You know, the units may deteriorate at, at, at different rates. Uh, the floor location, you know, so the, the higher the floor, the, the, the more attractive it is. The going price, the locational advantages in terms of access to particular amenities, the degree of surveillance of illicit activities. I mean, I, I, would, I, I tend to want some, you know, units that are close to some that kind of action because I can extract greater profit from it. But I don't want too much of it because then it puts me under sort of greater scrutiny from... Other, other residents, other, other brokers. The character of the social atmosphere of the building in which the, the unit is located. I mean, the popular understanding is that all, all the different buildings have their own their atmosphere, they have their own degree of organization, their own degree of, of sensibilities. And the extent of owner supervision over the control of the tenancy. Some, some owners, you never see them, you never hear from them. Other owners are really, you know, 
what's happening to my unit, calling every half an hour or something like this. So in there, all of these are conditions which describe characters of my, my holdings. And I want to balance it out. So if I'm, I'm tip in one direction and you tip in one direction, we have an implicit understanding that if that tip happens, we're going to exchange apartments to broker at some time in the future. So brokers also may attempt to narrow down their holdings to more easily manage standards and similarities around the character, conditions, and temporalities of tenancy. Others may attempt to maximize the heterogeneity of their holdings. So there are frequent trades and options, and even these implicit understandings. The right of a particular broker to acquire a particular unit at future time, even these like derivatives, these rights can be exchanged and optioned amongst brokers or as often the case, convert it into rights of access to other managerial opportunities. So these brokers are not just brokering ap apartment units. They're brokering access to jobs. They're brokering the, you know, access to the ability to manage the an intersection where people to direct parking, which is quite a lucrative activity in, in, in Jakarta. They include the right to provide services and extract fees from parking lots, markets, traffic intersections, and even access to particular volumes of goods and, and, and goods, goods and delivery systems. Because there's a great deal of because in, in, in Jakarta now, anything you want, you just use your WhatsApp, you whatever, and you get it delivered. So there's a great deal of competition around who can control these kinds of delivery systems. So what begins as an asset? A unit in an apartment building becomes stretched into dispositions that exceed calculation. What starts out as a particular piece of fixed capital with an assigned yet changing measurable value is converted through brokerage into a series of intensities. These intensities initially have their form in the unit of the apartment, but then they're dispersed and entrained to other rhythms of circulation and combination whose value cannot be calculated. So even though, um, on the one hand, this place is run by a kind of dictatorship of the developer, which, you know, it is, it, you know, politicians can't come in without permission. The police are not able to come into the complex without the permission of the developer. In some ways, the developer also controls nothing. With this kind of complex brokerage system of which the developer has no real sense of, there's also this kind of sense of what really runs this place. What really, what, who's really responsible for shaping how it, how it operates. So multiple apparatuses and logics and practices of exerting management thus all stand by each other in ways that don't necessarily intersect. It's always difficult for actors looking and speaking from particular positions and perspectives to garner any overarching story as to how things work or don't work. This is the case even when they are entrenched in a particular position, but circulate among them as many Jakartans do day in and day out. So in this sense, what I mean by compression is that when people begin to live under these sort of modalities of compression, that there's no way, there's no contradiction or collaboration for sure. There's no way to tell whether the vast array of makeshift seemingly improvised regulatory practices are tolerated top-down, or whether the interventions that percolate from below seep their way as facts on the ground upward through apparent hierarchies of control. It's almost impossible to tell, for example, how these networks of brokers acquire hundreds of units in a given complex, whether the, these brokers are really working together or not or whether the subsequent territories of distinct complexions and trades from <coughs> drug dealing to food delivery to prostitution to the formation of Islamic Association to the consolidation of queer friendly buildings. It's impossible to tell are they the culmination of planned deliberations on the part of gangs, parties, or associations or are they part of the incessant pushing and pulling, slippages and opening on part of groupings whose compositions may be only momentarily stable. Whatever the case, when you live in this place, you experience each disposition as, as, as equally plausible. Each stands by the other in a simultaneous connection and disconnection, where the grounds of a relationship rest in their seemingly having nothing to do with each other, and often concomitantly their relative autonomy contingent upon 
the fact that they have everything to do with each other. So in some ways, what I'm, what, what, what I'm trying to, to tell from these stories is the sense that with the values of freedom and equality, the fr- values of, of, of empowerment and inclusion, may still be values. But the format of which we understand and recognize these values perhaps can no longer take place in the kinds of language and tropes that we've relied on in the past. That we, have, we can continue to value these things, but the forms by which we recognize them, the forms by which we implement them, may lo- no longer be applicable within a kind of atmosphere, an urban atmosphere, that has this sort of intensive compression of many different... So we might have to think about new modalities, new ways of appearing that t- attempt to embody those things that are important, uh, are important to us. So here, disposition, dis- dispossession, that we have to dispossess ourselves of certain ideas that we have about what freedom and what equality might be. Here, dispossession becomes something else than simply eviction, indebtedness, or the absence of entitlement. Rather, dispossession is always enfolded in the efforts to make some form of strange commonality. Yet these expenditures that risk this disposition, these proximities, these feeling out of attachments, the working of the conditions to coexist, the obligations to both extend and be indifferent to one another, and to continuously invent new terms for both collaboration that need not look like it actually takes place. These things, perhaps, are the grounds of urban social life. Thank you very much. a lot about what, what is exciting about urban life and this idea about darkness and uh, the unknowability of the city that, that I think that's something that uh, really resonates, the kind of uh, excitement of knowing that there's stuff going on and, and you can't possibly know all of it so if, if, if we kind of recognise this darkness and this unknowability uh, I'd, I'd just be interested to know a bit more about your your methods and how you go about finding patterns in the darkness? <laughs> I can only say so much. <laughs> you could turn off the tape and we're going to discuss it. For this primarily, is, it, it, for this primarily it was um, it was an I mean, in Jakarta, there's, there, are, there, are sort of, there's, there are sort of social movements. And there are, there are NGOs, social movements, that attempt to, to work on behalf of the, of the poor. Uh, within, within the sort of slum areas of, 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 of Jakarta. Those areas that are that are most precarious, most vulnerable, subject to eviction, of which there is a great deal of eviction. Um, but there is hardly anything that takes place to deal with what I call the majority of residents of the city, who are not re- the poor, the poorest of the poor, but who are, you know, like I said, just this side of precarity. We have a degree of long home stabilization, um, and there's no, there's nothing taking place in these districts, which are the majority districts of, of of the city. So part of this is a process of trying to figure out footholds in terms of how to think through new forms of of local governance, different forms of activism. Um, so it comes from this, this attempt to... So local government within this situation is, 
the only thing, the only part of municipal government that is elected is the governor and the, the, the sort of, what they call the village leaders of, you know, 50 households or something like that. And then they, they sort of at a district level, um, what they call a kind of village committee. And they didn't have much money, they didn't have much money at all. They had some a small capital budget, but it was, to, it was to sort of demonstrate that you're gonna have, you can have local democracy at that kind of level. But they had no power, really no money. But they were there, and there, were, there was very little for them to do. So o over the course of a year, we negotiated somewhere that they could do stuff. And what they were to do was to, in some ways, begin to try to develop different kinds of narratives about what took place in these districts. Like, what's, what, what, what's the economy? What's, like, what are, what's, what's the sort of stories that are part of this area. Who are they? What are they doing? What are they? And, and so it's part of that, like working with groups of residents who constitute themselves on these village committees and working with them to try to just accumulate stories of all kinds, for pe particularly from people who seem to have networks, people who seem to be somewhat influential, but influential in what way? That, would be people gravitating around them, you know? With the guy who owned the, 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 the brothel on, on the railway track, this was sort of by accident, but wandering around at night, and then you would see, yeah, this is quite, quite a scene, quite, a, quite an activity. And not just about the sex trade, but people would come and gather there. And, I mean, it was a place you could drink, sort of. You can't really find a lot of places to drink in Jakarta. And, this place became a kind of sort of operational node. So it's 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 informed by this kind of attempt to how do you how do you how do you I mean not that I don't not that I don't consider sort of work and advocacy with the poorest of the poor and those most vulnerable to not be important, but it's what every what everyone seems to gravitate to, and what and then what what happens is that a whole bunch of other situations and areas and people are, are left out. And, and, and these are the, oftentimes the swing vote. These are also oftentimes the people who, yeah, are, are important in determining where a particular city goes. I have a question that follows up from what you just said. Um, okay. Maybe I should ask mine and then we'll open it back up again. And I guess it, on the one, the, the picture you paint to me is a picture of both hope and despair. It's almost kind of hope in the sense that you have perhaps something that is not gentrification with these different classes finding opportunities to advance and living alongside each other. So on the one hand, potentially you're drawing a picture of a city which developed has taken place without the levels of exclusion and expulsion. But at the other hand, you have a city in which people are becoming potentially quite atomized. You just spoke about the fact there may not be ways to connect them politically they may be living on different floors and be quite segregated from each other. So I'd be anxious, I'd be interested in your expanding on, on that particularly. Yeah, but I just, I, I, you know, it, it's, for me it's just the way it is. I mean, I, as, as, soon as, as soon as we sort of think about like hope and despair in it, it, it then, then that sort of clouds, for me it clouds sort of trying to see what it, to see what it is. I don't like, I mean, there's too, there's too much of like, there's too much of this thing like, okay, uh, this is interesting, but these people are living in shit, you know, or this is interesting, but there's so, it's, it's like such large levels of inequality here. Always the but. It's like, what would happen if you take out the but? I mean, and, but eventually you're gonna have to put it back in. I'm not saying that you never, you never put it back in, but. But how do you, how do you sort of live with just momentarily the no the no the no but, and that becomes an ethical problem sometimes because then what you're doing is you're sort of conceding that yes, sort of violence is normative, manipulation is normative, toxicity is normative in some way, um, but I think that somehow it's important to do that moment. I don't know for how long, but for, uh, 
Because in some ways this is what this is what this is this is what this is what it is, and we're, I, I, it's. Well, that's what that's what Moody was talking about when he said, like, all oh, these people, you know, these people who are living there, what what do they have on offer? They, you know, like all these all these building, all these complexes have shopping malls, you know, these shopping malls, and then they usually have a, like a Carrefour in the basement or a Giant or something like that, and uh, you know, and they're really awful. I mean, overpriced. They don't. So you know. If you're willing to leave that complex, walk out and walk 15 minutes, you have a huge market with, you know, goods coming in from the per periphery and and that half the price. So according to him, he, he says it's 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 selling more than it's ever sold it's sold before because it addresses a kind of middle middle class consumption that always to keep the keep the keep the price down. So that's a kind of that's a kind of proximity that's a kind of prox proximity that, that works. In another in, in another place that I know of Green, called Green Pramuka, which is a little more harrowing than Kalibaka, it's less less social, more it's more in the middle of nowhere. But the, the surrounding areas that have been it used to be a kind of um, uh, fabrication for tiles and bathroom fixtures and. And then that sort of went down, went somewhere else. But when the Green Pramuka came there, then then it was sort of was revitalized because people needed a place to do sort of economic stuff. So there was like investment in new workshops and small little uh, fabrication places. So all of those things that were then abandoned got reoccupied, in part to also produce locally because that that place you know had almost forty thousand. So there are there are there are there are instances of of of, of, mul of, of multiplier multiplier effects that that but they they rely upon very sort of a depth brokerage too to make to make them happen. Sometimes that brokerage is a little yeah. 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 Um, I'm, just, I'm thinking more about the, sort of the, the strikingness of your vertical highlight, 30,000 people in the highlight building. And he talks about how important social relationships are both between floors and between different groups of people. Was social isolation also something that you found in such close confined living? And if so, what are the repercussions of that? Is it not sleeping in the dark, it's just in the dark? Or? Sure. Sure. There, sure, there are... There are the, the, I mean, clearly, there, there, clearly, what? I mean, unlike unlike popular neighborhoods, I mean, I mean, popular neighborhoods have social isolation as well. But there's a there's a way in which when you live in a kind of popular classic neighborhood, you're you're hailed, you're greeted, you're. It's hard to sort of detach yourself from the kind of fabric of, of relationships. Whereas clearly in Kalibata, you you can. Um, but it. But it but it allows a kind of um, see this is the kind of interesting thing for me because in a way many of these most of Jakarta was auto constructed I mean even even if the state gave like land or it gave a kind of outlay of initial pavilion housing or even most of these neighborhoods were developed by the residents themselves and auto construction for them was not just buildings it was a way of life. It was creating a built environment that could actively choreograph intersections amongst people that were recognized as different and being able to contribute differentially to the survival of that, of that, of that, of that area. And, and people had a great deal of confidence in it, a great deal of, of, of a surety in it. It's not that they, 
it's not that they face some kind of dissolution. It wasn't that somehow they... But what's happened is that it's no longer perceived as sufficient. I mean, people express pride in it. We've done something. We know what we've done. We know what we've constructed. But yet, people are leaving. And not because, in part because pressure exerted, land pressure, price pressure, all these kinds of things. But there's also a sense of it's no longer enough. This is not the horizon for our, our lives. We have to sort of risk that. We risk that. To try to, do some, to try to do something else. And there's a kind of revisionism then that takes place once people leave. They'll, they'll look back and they'll say, oh, it was too many obligations, too many, too labor intensive, it's too much work dealing with these neighbors. They, they you know, like they steal water from us, and it's like, it's, you know, now we're more, more, we're more free to now pursue the real business of like making it, making it. So there's a certain amount of revisionism that, 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 does, that does take place. But, in, but people also really realize in Kalibata that there's no way they can go it alone. There's no way that they can really make it, make it alone. But the kind of collective life that begins to form is, is one of, of, of um, it's tricky because there's a certain amount of there's a certain amount of exemplification of the classic neoliberal thing about projects. All right, everyone wants to get together. Oh, okay, we'll, let's, let's meet. We'll meet. We'll talk about our new project. You know, we have to, we have to have a new project together. We have to, you know, and it usually goes nowhere. But we continue to meet. You know, we continue to sort of think through. So our our constant thinking through new projects becomes not a one of obligation, not of but but we we find a way to each other. We op begin to operate in this kind of small collective way. We, we begin to take we begin to take care of it, take, take care of each other in some way. And of course, there there the, there are each building has its own uh, WhatsApp groups, uh, which of which there. I mean, in my building, there there's literally some like hundreds of messages every day, and those messages are often times around all oh, the this happened or the. Electricity is here. How can we do, deal with this? How can we? So a lot of times there is a, well, just like in popular neighborhoods, a kind of coming together in trying to make the very concrete details of everyday life, everyday life work. But there's also a sense of, of really not, not, a, not. A, it's not a community thing. There's a residence association. There are activists that try to. There are, there are programs that are run by women to, for vaccination, care for young children. There are all these things, but it's not a, no way a community. It's a machine. It is a machine. And the machine has traces of these kinds of neighborly things and of people caring for each other, but yet it is a machine. And everyone is sort of plugged into different networks on the outside and and the coming together of that is always a kind of, there's a certain kind of turbulence, a sense of provisionality. It's interesting that no one calls, I, I, you never hear the word home in Kalibata. The word for home has disappeared. There's no, people call it a place. Something's happening in this place. My place is, you know. And there's a sense that, there's a constant sense of provisionality. No one expects to, stay there for very long. <coughs> and in fact, with, with, with in Indonesian law, and any complex like this, after 30 years, the, everything is reevaluated. Now, it used to be that you, you build and you 30 years, and then you pay the bribes necessary to get another 30 years. Here, I think the developer doesn't really, doesn't really care whether or not it lasts beyond 30 years or not. So there's a sense that, you know, you, 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 say, you Money to buy this. It's not going to be nothing in 30 years. But this sense of provisionality. But this provisionality is both a kind of source of tension but of opportunity. And the opportunity is not just simply kind of individualistic self accumulation, let get ahead by myself. But it is to a certain extent an opportunity to choreograph collective operations which somehow make sense. for a moment, that was very good. Um, I guess I was interested in um, the edges of the story you were telling, in the sense of um, 
I wondered if there was a booty or many booty equivalent uh, for the developer or the financial aspect to it, and whether how their stories and their modes of calculations and rationalities figure in the sorts of things you were mentioning, and whether there's something more you can say about that aspect to the set of stories you were telling us. Yeah, the developers are, are uh, the, the developers assume very powerful positions within Indonesian politics and society. Uh, developers fund the political game. Period. They're the most important <coughs> source of funding for a political competition. Uh, they basically largely can do what they what they what they want. Um, but you see, then who's a developer? Who's yeah. not a developer? There are, and, and what I know, this is how I know what I know. That is, if you have any urban development training in Indonesia, and you, and you want a formal job, and if you get a formal job, which is a big if, if you get a formal job, seven times out of 10, you'll work for the developer. That's, that's the, so over 10 years, many of the students I've taught are working with developers. But they have a kind of group, they have a WhatsApp group, they meet every two weeks to talk about what, what, what they feel happens in, inside. So there are about 20 key developers, in life, but there are thousands of other developers who may yeah. put together one or two things, you know, it's like who's a developer and who's not. But amongst the big players, what they describe is a, in that even though they have this kind of a surety of their, of their position, politically, uh, they, they generate a lot of money, uh, most of them have land banked things for the past three decades, land acquisition not really a big problem for them sometimes, they pay well to acquire land in, in choice locations, they get good compensation, usually cooperation with existing residents, you know, a new house, someone else, car, two, two color TVs. Not that they have a great deal of difficulty in piecing together land. But what, but, but, what my, what my ex-students talk about is an incessant anxiety on their part. They're, they're always anxious about what's, about what's, what's going on. A couple of students of mine, they, uh, their job is simply to work with different kinds of software. You know, these kinds of locational software that manage things according to 100 different variables. What's the best location in terms of affordability, close to employment, or all these kinds of, that's all they do. And they do that. But the developers never take it, they, they make them do this, but the developers never take it seriously. The developers will go to some, some kind of mystical, you know, backdoor thing in some cheap hotel, consult a mist, because they're so uncertain as to what, 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 what's take, to take place. They don't, and, and many of them describe the developers, even though legally and financially, they can exert total control over the interior operations of the things that they build. They constantly feel that they're out of control. They constantly feel <coughs> caught by their dependence upon generating the money that they, which requires, um, like the, what I described, all these systems of brokerage which they, have, they lose, lose sense of. So it's a kind of double position. They have absolute power, but that power, that vantage point almost, cultivates a kind of incessant anxiety, a kind of sense of vulnerability, which they're never quite sure of. So, yeah, so the, the part of the discussion amongst these group of students, about 70 of, of, of them, is always about what kind of small things can we do to <laughs> to mess up the system? <laughs> what kind of little things can we do to sort of defer things or to keep things, you know, not that that's a politics anyway, but it's, but it's, that's the sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have one more question. Maybe we should, uh, okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really like this idea of the, uh, And I was wondering if in these tablets, 
knocking through different apartments and reconfiguring this into a different kind of social space? Or is the urban tissue something that's much more um, immaterial and invisible in terms of these social and economic trends? Yeah, I mean, they, they, they try to a limited extent. I mean, since these are prefab constructions, there are certain limit constraints on to how much you can sort of re 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 rearrange. But it's more, it's, more, it's more in terms of colonizing particular passageways. It's a kind of ma a sense of, of, of contiguity. You, you, you have a line of different apartments so that in some ways the use of particular individual spaces can be reconfigured. So one unit may just simply become a kind of cooking space for three, three units or one unit will become a kind of place for the kids of multiple families to stay. This is the kids' area. Then they, so there's certain kinds of more social things that, that take place with bodies and living arrangements and, and the, 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 the cultivation of space and spatial arrangements that attempt to make up for what walls you can't, sometimes can't tear down to open, op, 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 open things up. So they're undoing that very kind of Yeah, no, I mean, the imagine, I mean, it's like the imaginary, the, the imaginary is uh, like completely disjointed from what the, in, the predominant living thing about Indonesian society, society, society is. Not, not to say, though, not to say that this doesn't become a kind of escape for some young people who are enmeshed in very complicated, you know, the, for example, they're, they're, the, there, there, no one has, to make a will in Jakarta is like no one ever does it. So, you know, you have 10 kids that may inherit a property, but there's no, there's no specification about who's, so there's oftentimes really long conflicts about, and also Indonesian law says that if you're, if you're just an uncle or cousin helped to put the roof on, he or she has a claim to that, so oftentimes within a kind of compound, you may have claims exerted by 30 people. Now, interestingly enough, this oftentimes is a hedge against development because it's tied up within legal proceedings for years and years and years. But sometimes it puts great strain upon individual family members who simply are, have a foothold there, and then they can't take it. They want somewhere else to like, be able to escape from. So there's these lines that connect sort of people who may live individually within these units still largely be focused on an extended family thing, but so it, it does vary. Okay.